Hello and welcome to another episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. I'm Dylan. I'm your host and joined now, as always, by my blue collar badass, Matt. How's it going, man? Things are good, Dylan. It's uh, It's been a great week here. A little crazy. We are, we're in that period of, of the year that my wife and I affectionately call hell month. Between uh, between construction just being busy in general in the spring and, and we have three boys playing four or five different sports right now it's there, there's hardly time to breathe but it it's a lot of fun yeah my parents were super happy when i got my license and uh could drive <laughs> myself and my sister but I, i'm pretty sure every parent uh you know looks forward to that day for sure for sure actually real quick before we get started um so we don't typically go after public work at, at Schaefer construction we're more of a design build firm Sometimes, especially when it's in our backyard, we will we'll do the plan spec route. And we, we did that recently. Um, we won a project on Tuesday. And I just wanted to throw a quick shout out to a guy. Um, it, it came down to my, my firm and another firm. And this is so atypical in our industry. And we might touch on this today in conversation anyways. But after we were awarded the, the project on late Wednesday night, um, I got a message, direct message from the leader of the other firm just congratulating me and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, Jeff, I know you listen once in a while. I wanted to say thank you. I thought that was pretty cool. And, and I wish more people in our industry would act that way. <laughs> that is super cool. And yeah, th- as we get into it, it's going to be a, a big point that we're going to touch on today because I've worked at a bunch of engineering firms and (laughs) there's a few that left a real bad taste in my mouth on the way out and things like that and congratulating people on a win, right? Because especially in things that are in your community, in your backyard, you're going to be a part of. (laughs) So you want want that project to be a success. You're probably going to go to that building, especially if it's a public type project. So, you know, grace on both sides, winning, uh, not being awarded a project, hugely important, treating people with respect across the board, um, you know, whether they're competitors or, or not, you're more than likely going to work with those people in some way, shape or form, especially in our industry. Um, and even if they don't work in your local jurisdiction, <laughs> you're going to run into them at a conference at some event somewhere. Our industry is not that big guys. Uh, having a little grace is just that having a little grace it goes a long way absolutely Um, so oh thank you for sharing that without further ado i'd love to introduce our guest this week cameron beeks cam your uh your people gave me a wonderful bio and i'm gonna go off script here so as (laughs) (laughs) getting to know you a little bit and really going through your bio. I was, I'm super impressed, man. As a, you know, you graduated from Oregon state in 2013 with honors as a mechanical engineer, you worked through school through your last two years and to still graduate with honors is super impressive. And then to really ascend the corporate ladder very quickly, you know, getting your license, um, becoming an associate 2015, a VP in 2017, a sector, lead uh, for education at Glumac in 2019. I mean, this is kind of an unheard ascension in our, our industry, but totally, totally possible. And then, you know, you've written software for engineering programs. You brought automation and really forward thinking to an industry that needs it <laughs> in a lot of ways. And then, you know, from some of the personal things that you've gone through with just stress and, and health issues to battle through that and still be on top of your game and and lead a team, lead, you know, a group of engineers um, is just truly impressive. So welcome to the show. What a, what a humbling introduction. I, I really appreciate to be on the show, Dylan, excited to have the conversation today. And I guess with that, how, how'd you get your start (laughs) <laughs> at Blue Mac as a, you know, this is probably summer of your sophomore year, uh, yeah. to, uh, you know, be where you are today. Yeah. Well, it's funny because there's people that actually know the real answer to this. So if I ever were to change the story, people would know I'd be lying. Um, so I, I give a lot of credit to, you know, of course my folks, um, but I give a lot of credit in particular to my maternal grandmother, 
um, all throughout middle school and my early youth, she was talking about just the importance of energy and how energy is a tremendous opportunity, not only to make an impact on the world, but also a career decision because we will always need energy. We will always need water and being aware of those things and seeing if there's a way you can get involved um, with the development and creation for how people interact with those types of necessities um, is a huge career opportunity. So a lot of props to you know my Nana uh, for introducing me to the industry. And uh, what's funny is that when I was in high school, I grew up in Sherwood, Oregon. And when you go to high school there, they give you this sign up for these courses and put down your goal of what you wanna do. And uh, the goal I wrote, and I was in eighth grade at the time, I wrote that I wanted to design uh, lead buildings. Um, and so that's what I wrote down as a goal in eighth grade. and went through high school and eventually went to Oregon State. I was a part of their honors college because the class sizes there were about 20 or so students. Um, so it was a tremendous opportunity for me to get one-on-one -on -one time with a lot of professors that cared about student success. And then I just happened to be at a career fair my freshman year. And I started out in college as a civil engineer because like many college students, I knew I wanted to get involved in something, but being arrogant and know-it-all as a senior in high school, I chose the wrong major. And so I was quickly corrected. It was fall quarter at Oregon State at a career fair that I met Judy Ebmeyer, who is an Oregon State alum, and she was a senior electrical engineer and project manager at Glumac. And she said, well, you're saying all the right things. You care about the built environment. You care about energy, but why are you a civil engineer? Because they do a lot of lateral infrastructure work. And we're in the vertical infrastructure environment, and we think that you should change your degree. Nothing against civils when it comes to water resiliency and water is a basic human need. Phenomenal, phenomenal career path. But I was a little bit more attracted to the energy aspects of it, and in particular, commercial HVAC and net, net zero or net positive energy. And so I switched my major after my conversation with her, as well as Mitch Deck, who was a, a senior associate at Glumac at the time, and then Remley Wilson, who was a principal. He's since retired, also at Glumac. And uh, Switched my degree to mechanical, finished up my freshman year. Um, then I went into my sophomore year, met with Glumac again at a career fair. And uh, that's when things started to become real. And I gave them my resume, say, I switched my major. I'm in the honors college. I'm taking a bunch of the USGBC courses. And to all the students that may be listening to this, you can go above and beyond and demonstrate your interest in the industry by finding alternative learning techniques or learning programs that are out there online that you can register for and you can go above and beyond to make your resume really stand out in comparison to everybody else's. So I wanted to differentiate myself. So I signed up for some of these USGBC courses, learned a little bit about LEED, came into the room, not really knowing anything, but knowing at least a little bit, you know, compared to my competition, you know, you need to run faster than the person next to you when you're running from a bear. Um, and so I got my dream job my sophomore summer i was working at active water sports down in clackamas oregon and because i grew up playing water sports my entire life and i just thought oh what a cool gig i'm going to be able to you know go water skiing and wakeboarding all summer long and then i get this phone call from glumac and it's like we want to hire you so whatever you're doing right now you need to be here on this date and so that the rest is history you know I, they brought me on after my sophomore year i had the absolute privilege of working with mr steve strauss who was the president at the time I was his intern for three months, and then they were more than gracious to offer me a 32-hour employment shift when I went back to school. And the engineering buildings were actually across the street from Glumac, and next to Glumac was a Jimmy John's and a coffee shop. So I could go to school, I could get my lunch, get my coffee, go to work, and then I'd be able to go home at the end of the day and work on whatever projects. And of course, don't get any sleep because you know I'm working way too much while I'm in school trying to make make it through. So. That's how I got into this industry, man. And it's been a uh, hold on and uh, try and keep up the rest of the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I went to high school, I'm born in Virginia, but I moved to Oregon for high school and lived on the Oregon coast. So I lived in Brookings. Oh, and uh, yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's like San Francisco. You know, the Ooh. coldest winter you ever had was a summer in San Francisco. That's uh, <laughs> basically the same thing. Fog all uh, all the time. Rains 120 yeah. inches a year. It's you know temperate rainforest. Yeah. But with that, my my neighbor was a electrical engineer, retired, and he worked for decades at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. He worked on the 
a lot of laser programs and Star Wars and energy was their kind of next frontier in trying to do uh, fission, which I think they've been able to sustain some reactions, and at least talked about it publicly. So um, growing up off the grid, all that stuff, uh, energy is <laughs> kind of near and dear to, to what I'm, I'm about as well. It is it is impressive, uh, to say the least, the the workload that it takes to do what you did. Um, I did it for a while. I I worked in construction and ran companies while I was was putting myself through college. Certainly not, I, I don't think to the degree that you did. So uh, hats off for that because that is that is no small feat to keep up with all of that. It, it's about like doing four full time jobs. There's a lot of really tremendous people that I had to work with, and then um, I I say it because it's true. Uh, all the time. The only reason why I graduated college is because of the group of people that I studied with that would bring me up to speed way faster. And it just really goes to the importance of surrounding yourself with good people. Absolutely. Forming, forming a mastermind of, of people that can help bring you up is, is key. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Yep, exactly. Yeah. One of the, I guess, next things in that, so you've designed all types of systems over the years and in mechanical especially there's there's been for sure some advancements in, in how we design buildings but a lot of the traditional systems that we design like VAVs have been around for 50 years you know chilled beam is for sure a, a newer thing that we're seeing put in more projects uh, definitely the technology isn't super old um, or it kind of is but I guess elaborate on in talking about net zero and some of those things that we're really seeing, especially in California for building design, which we, we all know this eventually goes to the rest of the country uh, when we talk about energy, but how from a mechanical engineering standpoint, are you looking at systems, system designs for a lot of your uh, projects these days? Yeah, really good question. So uh, I, I actually try and get involved with net zero buildings even before we start considering systems. Uh, if we can focus on the massing and if we can get all of our glazing facing to the north and we limit the amount of southwest glazing and if we you know, look at overhangs on the southern facade and optimize what angle that, that, that shading needs to be or how far out it needs to extend from the building. Um, if we focus on putting our back of house spaces on the south or west side of the building so that we don't need those openings, you know, causing the solar heat gain. And of course, that's driven by a solar type building, of course, talking about Los Angeles specifically in colder climates, you know, that sun up in Michigan is more than welcome. Uh, but again, it's, it's taking a look at the massing, taking a look at how the building's actually opening up to the environment uh, and optimizing the, the massing first. I think that, uh, a lot of um, uh, technologies and systems have allowed us to become lazy in design. And we are relying on systems and technology to actually bail us out. So I take a philosophy of reduce, reuse, renewable, and then reinforce. Those are kind of the four steps that I take with regards to net zero energy. So first and foremost, you reduce as much energy as you possibly can on the project when you're just talking about the massing first, and then you start talking about systems and figuring out, okay, how can I look at systems, whether that's just a highly efficient air handling unit with the AV system, because they can, if designed correctly, be highly efficient. With active chill beams, I want to save that for another point that I want to make. But again, another highly efficient system, pushing water around, highly more efficient than pushing air around. So, of course, radiant systems are, are a great technology out there as well. Uh, and then you start talking about reuse. So you want to reuse as much waste, heat or energy as you possibly can. You want to recirculate that back into the building. So now we're talking about things like variable refrigerant flow with heat recovery. You're talking about heat recovery chillers, but not making every single chiller module heat recovery, just the ones that you think you'll need to handle your base heating load and nothing more than that. You do supplemental heating systems that are a lot more cost effective to handle those peak heating days. And then once you get through that reuse cycle, and of course you can do crazy things like recovering heat off of sewer lines and you know other things like that. The power pipe that you can go buy at Home Depot is extremely cost effective, and I always recommend it for you know when you bring back gray water to a centralized location in your building because gray water is roughly ambient temperature, which is usually warmer than the groundwater. So you get some free heating or preheating of your domestic hot water system just because you have toilet water going down the drain. Toilet water sits in a toilet bowl that's exposed to ambient conditions. It's ambient temperature, which is warmer than that domestic water coming into a building. 
simple things like that where we're reusing waste is a great next step. The last thing, and the reason why we do reduce and reuse first is because we don't wanna waste a bunch of money on renewables. We don't wanna solve all of our problems by throwing money at things. So going through a data-driven approach on reducing energy, reusing energy, and then maximizing your cost effectiveness at your renewable solution, whether that's wind turbines, solar, ground source heat pumps, et cetera, that's really gonna make it practical for projects. And that's the hardest thing in our industry is actually communicating in a way to an owner to feel confident in the decision that they're making or to a contractor so that they feel comfortable that the path you've set up for them to follow is not only constructible, but actually cost effective. And you know what you're doing, you know what you're actually drawing on paper because those lines matter. And the last step, and this is, in my opinion, the most important, we're doing this with CSU Long Beach right now on their net zero housing building that's going up on Atherton. Um, and we're working on coming up with a plan for them to actually work with the students to reinforce what this building's about. You can design a building to be net zero, but if the users and operators don't commit to using that building appropriately within the guidelines and parameters that we designed around, you can give someone a Prius all day long, but it can have the fuel mileage of a Ferrari if you drive it like a Ferrari. So it's it's really important that the users buy into what we're putting in front of them. Well, I'm going to jump in because <clears throat> quite candidly, when when Dylan told me we were bringing a, another MEP engineer on board, I thought, oh boy, this is going to go one of two ways. And I can <laughs> tell you that it is incredibly refreshing and, and reassuring to hear what you just said, you know, because from, from the builder side, from the, the contractor side, um, and also from a developer side, so much of what we see is, is cost driven. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a, there's a contingent of the builder side that doesn't give a shit and they just want to build it. And if it, if it kills nature, if it, you know, burns trees and, and kicks kittens, nobody cares, but there's, there's a lot of us who, who want to find that balance. But there, there's so many systems out there available that depending on if you're in, you know, southeastern Michigan or in, in Los Angeles, they just don't make sense financially for, for both cases. Um, so to hear you say that, you know, you start off focusing on, uh, on the intrinsic value, but then also the economic factors on how to balance that and not, not just installing a VRF or a, or a heat recovery just for the sake of installing it, but, but truly putting the thought and the time into to figuring out how it's going to benefit the end user. That's, that's huge for me. So thank you. <laughs> All right. So just to give you a little bit of background, Matt. So I, I'd say about 70% of the work that I do, and I, I run our education sector nationally for Glumac and about 70% of what I'm personally in charge of as a principal in charge down here in the Southern California area, 70% of that is design build education work for the public market sector. And so we are very familiar operating with a cost estimator and with a contractor during during that pre-con effort. We have design managers we work with so that we do cost value design. And that's highly, highly important. And if, if we weren't good at doing that, then I don't think the contractors would want to bring us on board to carry our egos around. Well, you're, you're speaking my language now, so <laughs> we're going to have a good chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and I think that's highly important is, you know, for a good chunk of the country and still a lot of the work that gets done, it's, you know, plan and spec. It's design, bid, build with no true communication between the, the design team and the construction team. You know, uh, an engineer <laughs> by and large has no idea what anything costs. Same with a lot of architects. They, they truly don't know. They, you know, like even talking about massing models and doing an energy model up front, a lot of architects will shake their head and just say, what's that? Right. Or, you know, there's a time and a place to use a lot of the tools that we have at our disposal to do things like an energy model that now you get, you can run through iterations. You can do, you know, what does this orientation look like? What is doing a sun study? Like how often does that actually happen in a project? You know, I know you guys are doing them, but <laughs> like in, in general public, I think, heck, I, I'm sure half the architects I've, worked with don't even know what one is or let alone how to do one. Yeah. I, it, what, and what's ironic about that is that by doing those simple studies, which I, I, when you, when you asked that rhetorical question, I kind of laughed on the inside because I'd ask it in reverse, you know, what engineers are out there, architects that are out there that aren't doing it because they really should be. 
Um, the reason why I think it should be is because that's when you find your zero cost energy savings um, or your, your low cost energy savings on projects. Uh, if you're not doing those types of things, as far as I'm going to just set this building on this block and I'm going to do whatever I want to it with little to no care. Um, think about trying to do that type of design back when we're talking about the Roman age, right? When there was no HVAC, when there was no artificial lighting, when there was no X, Y, Z. And again, back to my original point, technology and system fail us out for very lackadaisical design. And it doesn't take that much extra effort. And once you go through a couple of projects where you make this a part of the normal workflow, it becomes a no cost or low cost design effort. And it becomes a part of just your framework and your kind of the, the thread that you're cut from as a company. So um, I would implore everybody listening to this to you know, just reach out and we're all trying to make the industry a better place and reach out to people like Dylan and like Matt and myself, because, you know, there's some simple techniques that we try and employ on every single project just because it makes it just a little bit better. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. So I was going to say this question till later, but we're kind of already touching on it. Um, you know, your, your focus now sounds like on, on pretty large projects in the education sector how do you take the technology and, and some of the net zero or, or close to net zero technology and, and options and scale it down to a smaller project, you know, to a 12,000 square foot building, let's say in a, in a rural area and, and leave me to decide how to sell it to the owner, because that's, that's a different story, but how physically can you scale that down so that they can see some of the same, uh, same cost benefits, same environmental benefits, but obviously it's not in the same, the same scheme that you would see in a in a college for say yeah it well it starts at the massing right so i have a roughly it's i think 16,000 18,000 square foot building uh, in construction right now it'll be done in a month or two and that's net zero um and in in all reality smaller buildings are much much easier to deliver net zero uh, if you look at all the living buildings that are out there and i think the total number of living buildings that exist is still in the 20s but if you look at the square footage for those buildings, many of which are in very rural areas, and this was the only way that they could actually get the project done what, is by making it a net zero energy project and a net zero water project um, because there were no utilities around. So if you look at the scale, the optimal scale, of course, is an FAR of around two, no more than two, because once the area of your site starts to get small in relation to the amount of floor area that you have, your PV, opportunity to square footage of building use becomes smaller. And sure. so when you're talking about the scale that you're mentioning, that FAR should be around a one or a two. And then you wanna make sure the building of course is oriented east-west where you have your longer facade exposures are facing out to the north. You take care of the solar load by doing a little bit of overhangs on the southern facade unless your climate accepts that solar heat gain. You're looking at really tight envelopes in cold climates. Uh, you're looking at breathable envelopes in temperate climates and then with regards to how you do the mechanical conditioning, um, you, you try and see if you can find, uh, in my opinion, I do think that VRF from an installer standpoint has become more of the norm. People are more familiar with it. They are finding cost effectiveness with it. Is it a pair to a package unit? No, it, it, there's, a, there's a cost premium there, but perhaps there's some cost savings in your system sizing by again, putting your back of house spaces on those west facades, on those southwest corners, and you're moving those back house spaces into areas where you you try and block off as much windows as you can because it makes the overall system capacities smaller for your mechanical solutions that you're providing. So it's trying to shed first and foremost, and then from there it's what what opportunities for reuse do you have? So that scale, probably looking at variable refrigerant flow, so we're not looking at a complicated hydronic system. It's not the scale of a hydronic system in my opinion. You're looking at a good solid massing, you're looking at really good insulation, and then you're looking at probably a photovoltaic solution. In my like opinion. Yeah. Hey, well, and I respect your opinion now, so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, this is probably a good segue into it. You know, we talk about a lot of data on projects and there's, you know, quite a bit of rule of thumbs, you know, like you just listed off for a lot of systems, orientations, kind of good design rules of thumb, but how, how do you really think uh, and process data in making decisions? And I know that's kind of a, <laughs> a big question, but you know, uh, you can tackle that kind of any way you'd like and we'll, we'll go from there. 
Sounds good. Well, I, I am just absolutely fortunate to work with a world-class energy team. Uh, our energy team is run by our building sciences group, uh, Chris Lowen out of our Portland office, and then he has two energy leads. Uh, one does the northern region, Brian Goldcrump, and then Brian Stern, who does the southern region. And uh, the, the process and workflow that they've developed is second to none. It's pretty phenomenal. And it, it has a huge emphasis on the importance of digital twinning. And what a digital twin is, is essentially a, another existence of the design, just in a completely separate model that you can control the parameters of it. A lot of engineering firms and do a lot of energy analytics based on the architect's model. And there's a lot of pitfalls that come with using the architect's model because it could be highly unstable or, or information could be represented in a way that isn't uh, conducive for doing proper energy modeling. So we do the digital twinning. And then once we build a Revit geometry or an IESVE model in its own independent model, we can manipulate that as much as we like. So we can apply different systems. We can apply different efficiencies. We can, you know, one thing I forgot to mention on the reduced side is LED technology, of course, is more readily available. It's a lot more cost effective. It's a very easy solution when you're talking about um, uh, low cost lighting energy savings. Um, but you can run through several parametrics of different system types as well as uh, different lighting types, as well as envelope configurations. Um, by having a digital twin, we're not reliant on the architect's model windows. We can manipulate the window to wall ratio however we want. We can play around with the, the window performance, the solar heat gain ratio, the U value, as well as different types of envelope insulation techniques. So by having this digital twin and being able to literally iterate as many times as we want, we found, because we've done this so many times, that in certain climates, we iterate certain very specific things. So we've already gone through the learning curve of wasting time focusing on making the insulation a lot thicker down here in Los Angeles, because when you do that, you're actually penalizing the building because your worst case cooling day is usually solar driven, where outside it's actually cooler. And so you want to be able to lose heat from your space to the outdoors, but you're just really impacted by that sun coming through the glass which is counterintuitive. A lot of people think that, hey, I wanna save energy. Let's go ahead and insulate the heck out of these walls. When in reality in LA in particular, over insulating can actually be a detriment. So by doing this digital twinning and, you know, and we're up and down the West Coast, we're down in Texas, we're out in Shanghai. Um, we've, we've got lots of climates that we've looked at and California is extremely diverse from a climate standpoint. So we know what to look at. We use digital twinning. We use high quality energy modeling softwares. And then you just do it over and over. So you start to, oh, there is one thing in particular that is special. A lot of energy modeling softwares out there are limited with regards to how you set up the controls for your systems. A lot of energy savings happens on the control side of when you turn equipment on, how you balance static pressure reset, how you balance supplier temperature reset. And we actually do our own custom on the site programming to supplement where energy modeling programs are insufficient still. They're getting there, but we, we do take it upon ourselves to bring them up to the level that we need in order to be truly accurate. Best part of all, we do all the measurement and verification after our projects, and we make sure that they actually do perform where our energy modeling team had it modeled. Uh, and the importance of that is because maybe an assumption we made was wrong and we need to learn from that and evolve as an engineering firm. And conversely, we can advise the owner, hey, you're not operating the building the way we intended or hey, there's this control valve that's stuck open and it's not turning off during the during the weekends and you're just wasting a bunch of energy, you might as well go turn that off. So um, that, that closed loop from a design standpoint is extremely important so we can continue to improve ourselves. So digital twinning, getting that feedback, knowing what iterations to run in the digital twin and using a reputable energy modeling software. That's how we go through our system selections and advise clients using actual data. So that's an interesting, interesting concept you brought up and it, I don't think it should be, <laughs> but the follow-up factor that you just mentioned, do you, from your experience, do you find that that's pretty rare in the industry for, for the design side, the consultants to actually then go back after the fact, after it's built and occupied? Mm -hmm. Is it, is that a rare thing? Cause I've never, I've never known anyone to do that. And it makes a lot of sense the way you just explained it, but but again, I've never seen it. I've never heard of anyone actually checking. It's it's more of just design it and then get it out. It's it's one of those things where we're just lucky to have some of the best clients, um, the clients that care about that. And so we've had the opportunity where clients actually hire us to come back out and make sure that the buildings are performing in the way that we've designed. 
So is it a rarity? I'd say it's not a rarity for the consultants because I think all the consultants out there want to want to know that data and want to have that data, but it's it's quite a bit of work. And so to have the privilege of working with owners that care about how their systems operate and working with institutional type clients like the GSA or the, the, the state or education clients or healthcare providers um, or data center providers or microelectronics you know, manufacturers, they care about how their buildings operate. And so they want us to make sure that it's tuned correctly. And you know, we do have a commissioning branch as well. And so our commissioning team does go out and audit a lot of our, a lot of our projects where they're brought on as commissioning agent too. Hmm. Yeah, so I'll answer that from the other side. Every firm that I've worked for, most everybody was so I've worked in both AE and MEP teams and the a es we rarely did it typically what happens is frankly the architects are scared to go and talk back to their clients because they're worried about problems <laughs> they're worried about getting sued I mean that's that's the reality of it is um, they're just they're they're scared to to go back and have a conversation about a, a problem and catch it before it becomes big because from what I've seen, most clients and just like anybody, right? They just want it fixed. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't looking to necessarily assign blame. I mean, that that's going to come regardless. It's going to be, can you fix it? And if you fixed it well enough, right? It's just like a if a doctor screwed up a surgery, if he can fix it, most people and has a good bedside manner, most people aren't going to sue him, right? It's the guy that is hard and callous and still screws up. But <laughs> like that, that, that ends up getting sued. So that's from what I've seen a lot. And the so in 2013, I went to New York for the one and only Case Conference. So if you remember Case from uh, back in the day, they did a ton of really cool things in the built environment on measurement verification in how you go about building stuff. Case had a whole suite of apps. We work ended up buying them. They actually bottom during that conference or the buyout was uh, at that conference in New York in 2013. And the cool thing about WeWork was exactly what you're talking about, the measurement verification piece that they installed. They did a lot of other dumb things like I talked about, but this measurement verification piece and figuring out how spaces operated, what was good, what was bad, was really the core technology, I'm going to call it, that they had in that data that most building owners, you know, now CBRE is starting to incorporate some of that stuff in their spaces. And, you know, they own and maintain a lot of, a lot of commercial buildings. Yeah. But with that, like that was the core piece that we work really had from the tech side. I don't think it granted the, or warranted the valuation that got put on them, but uh, that was the really cool piece of what, what they did. So, I mean, for what you guys are doing, 100% and behind it, I just, I think too many people are scared of being sued where if they just had those conversations and got ahead of problems, they would avoid a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And again, it's just really owner driven. I mean, um, you, you mentioned WeWork, they, they're one of our global clients as well, or if they were one of our global clients. Yeah, <laughs> yeah WeWork had a lot of other <laughs> things going on <laughs> for them, yeah. but uh with that, so, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot here. We love construction, right? This is why we do this. We're not making any money from this other than to kind of indoctrinate people and solve problems, bring about uh, big topics that people need to hear about, whether it's mm -hmm. pricing or labor or culture. So, you know, you do a lot of adjunct uh, teaching as well and really trying to help bridge that gap between uh, school of any sort, right? Whether that's high school, you know, teaching at the college level uh, to bring them into the workforce, kind of walk us through maybe the gap that you see there from, from university to, you know, being a consulting engineer and really just construction as a whole. Yeah. Wow. That's a big question. Um, I, yeah, I've, to answer the initial start to where we headed with this. Yes, I've been very fortunate to have opportunities at a couple of universities here in California um, to, to work with some of the students on bridging that gap from their university career into some type of consulting career, whether that's an architect or if that's a, a MEP consultant. 
during those conversations, and I think that it's, I think that the the title of the lectures it's it's called "Shit That Matters That Nobody Teaches." Um, and I, what we talk about is we talk about who you are as a person first, um, and we talk about life. And life is extremely important um, when we when we define who we are, when we meet somebody at a conference or when we meet somebody at a bar or whatever, you know, you start talking about what you do for a profession, but your profession is not what should identify you. So I actually do two introductions during those lectures. I identify myself as, hey, let's give myself some cred because I've been in the industry for, you know, 10, 11 years and um, I, I hope to know what I'm talking about. And so I hope that you listen to me, but then I do a second introduction that talks about the fact that I'm I'm married. I have two dogs. I love to experience culture. I love the outdoors and nature. Um, so when I say culture, that really means that I love to check out different cuisines. I love to travel. I love photography um, and I love to be creative. So I play around with videography and stuff. But that's where it starts. It starts with who we are as people first, because you could lose your job one day. You could, you know, your, your company could go out of business. You could, whatever it is, your career could stop suddenly for some unexpected reason. For me, I, May 28th, 2019, I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer and my world was flipped upside down. And um, that's, I think the point in my life that I realized that as much as I absolutely love the construction industry and as much as I love the consulting industry, um, I need to remember that I'm very human. Everybody I work with is human. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has success and everybody has mortality. Um, hubris is something that we need to avoid as, as young individuals, young successful individuals, um, thinking that you know it all and you can survive anything and you can do anything. Um, so that's one of the big messages that I share with students is make sure that you really understand who you are first. And that can be a really hard thing to figure out. Um, so go explore, go, go adventure, go for a hike in Spain, you know, go for something, right? So I had to figure out if this truly is something that you are going to be passionate about, because to survive in this industry, you do need to be passionate about it. We then shift into talking about how to how to do interviews and what we focus on is phrasing. That's the biggest thing when a senior engineer and I learned this the hard way. When a senior engineer walks you through a set of drawings or a senior architect walks you through a set of drawings, a lot of us have that that automatic response of saying, OK, I know, I know, I know. And you don't mean that you already know what they're telling you. What you mean is that you're following. And so maybe just say, oh, I see, or, hey, I'm following. All right, I see where you're going with that. Instead of automatically just shutting them off, I know. Um, it's just, uh, it, it doesn't leave yourself open to learning. And I know that a lot of young professionals try and exude this sense of confidence, but the thing that I talk about is humble confidence. You can achieve humble confidence by using specifics as to things that you've done. And quite frankly, when you talk about those experiences, it's probably not gonna be nearly as holistic as what the senior engineer or the senior person who's been in the industry for 25 years or 35 years and their boots are older than you coming out of school. Um, just be specific and, and talk exactly about what it is that you have experience with. And wherever you leave off in that explanation, always leave room for growth, always leave room for feedback. And that's the humble side of it is you can find an opportunity to present your knowledge in a way that actually seeks feedback from someone who you can learn from. Uh, and then of course we talk about some other things that are extremely important. So we talk about money and how the financials work in you know, working for a consulting engineering firm and how your billing rate translates to a client into your paycheck and project success and how that's important. You don't you don't want to be a Carson Wentz, you want to be an Aaron Rodgers, so you never want to be overpaid. Uh, no offense to you Eagles fans, actually full offense to you Eagles fans out there, go pack go, no offense Matt. Um, <laughs> and then we talk about success. And my favorite book is The First 90 Days by Michael Watkins. Uh, the First 90 Days is phenomenal for his methodical approach to creating success no matter what profession you seek or no matter what task you seek. And it talks a lot about coming in and being a learner first, um, establishing where your expertise can actually align, um, how you can start to automate, you can start to find these small wins. And then once you found those small wins, those wins start to create momentum and you'll start to get more trust because people identify you as, well, it was a small thing, but you're still a winner. And you can keep building that winning momentum and do bigger and bigger things with that momentum. And then when you do fail, 
you already have that momentum built up. And so there'll be a lot more forgiveness for that failure. And you want to focus on the little things. You know, someone might ask you to go wash their car as an intern, what have you. Go wash the car, get it detailed, return it back with no scratches and do a good job, right? And make sure that you find a way to very, very humbly make sure that you did it correctly because that'll force recognition from whoever your supervisor is by asking if, hey, did I do this the way that you wanted me to? That forces them to say, you actually did. Um, and so you get that small win and then you keep building on that momentum and then you start talking about things that are bigger than that. So finding other people that align with the same strategy that you like to do and then building teams and then finding team success. Um, so that book's phenomenal. So the steps, life is critical. You have to remember we're all human. Um, we're here temporarily in this industry. Um, it, the, the industry doesn't define who you are. And then we talk about that humble confidence and the importance of humble confidence as a young, wanting to be successful professional. We talk about money and then we talk about how to actually build success as a consultant. There is so much great stuff to unpack in that. <clears throat> First of all, I, I don't think you can see it because of our logo, but my core values of my company are right behind us. And the first one is, is humbly confident. So you, yes, you, you spark my interest immediately on that. So that, <laughs> it's awesome to hear, but it's so true. Um, and, and the momentum portion you mentioned, you know, the small wins in, in my house, we, we say it kind of jokingly, we're, we're stacking chips, you know, whenever my boys start succeeding or, or, you know, my oldest is, I think four races deep taking first place in his cross country team. And, you know, I, we just have these conversations like you just said, and he's only 14, but you know, you, you collect the small wins, you build momentum and, and that holds true in a 14 year old's world as much as it does in a 41 year old's world and, and everywhere in between. So that, that, that was really awesome points you made there. One of the best lines I think I've heard when because and i don't know where it comes from it's a cultural thing to say i know right and it's not i know i know it's that you what you really mean and what you should say but i think it becomes a brevity thing that isn't necessary is it's okay to say a few extra words right we've, we've talked about this in like intros and what you do like to state the problem that you solve and then what the solution is that you do right you're not a you're not an engineer that builds buildings. It's, there's a lot of, you know, educational facilities that need net zero energy. Well, we do that, right? Like it's a different way to introduce yourself that takes longer, but is better. And instead of saying, I know one of the best quotes I've heard is, I think I have an understanding, but mm -hmm. I'd like to tell me more, right? I think I understand, but I'd love to learn more. And it's a, it's a long, longer statement, right? But it, it's accurate. And I think far too often, in a lot of our speech patterns, we don't say accurate things. We just, we cut for brevity. And mm -hmm. if we took a little more time and expanded upon them for accurate statements versus brief, we'd all be a lot better <laughs> than, uh, than speaking in sound bites. So Dylan, question for you. Uh, when you were, when you were in engineering school, did they teach you how to delegate? No. So imagine every entry level engineer being delegated to by someone who has no formal training in delegation. And to your point, cause you just hit on something. Tell me more. I'm trying to understand. Tell me more. Could you keep explaining what you mean by that? Tremendous value in that. Um, we, we try and use or try and um, encourage people to use repeating. So I'm going to repeat back to you what I heard you say to make sure that I understand this correctly. And we recommend that to our staff because it's also a great diffusing technique if something does hit the fan on a project, right? Oh, this is really bad. I understand that you're mad. You're just riddling off a bunch of things that you think are wrong, but I'm only hearing that there's actually two things that are wrong. So just repeating back, okay, I understand that there's a lot of stuff resulting because of these two things here and just refocusing them. Well, I, I'm still only hearing that there's two things here. So let's focus on what we can actually do to fix it. Um, but that's also very true when you're when you're getting delegated to. Um, and, and delegating is a skill. Not everybody's good at it. Um, quite frankly, a lot of people are really bad at it, me especially, because I'll ask somebody for something and they'll give it back to me exactly as I asked for it. 
and it's not what I wanted. Um, I'm like, this is 100% exactly what I asked for, but boy, did I not ask it the right way. So um, your point, very, very important. And one of the things, so uh, a phrase to start out in that is, this is what I heard, and then say that. Or if I'm understanding correctly, and then that leads in pretty well to the whatever you're going to say next. Because it's it's just you repeating back to your point, but those are like the <laughs> the entry words, if you will, to to then have that conversation. Yeah. We are getting up on time. And before we get into the final couple questions here, Cam, where can everybody find you? <laughs> I, I, I'm on LinkedIn. I and, and people can find me um, on, on Glumac's website as well on the leadership page. I, it's uh, www.glumac, that's G-L-U-M-A-C.com. Uh, Glumac was founded by Mr. Dick Glumac back in 1971 uh, in San Francisco, California. And he uh, has quite a tremendous story that is is I would not give it the justice it deserves or respect it deserves if I tried to cram it into the last couple of seconds here. But www.glumac.com. Awesome. And so one of the big things that we we like to talk about here is well, so we'll start with where do you think the industry is heading? What do you think the next five, 10 years holds for for the construction industry? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm going to answer it two ways. Uh, first of which, I think that I'm going to answer it three ways. I, so we're going to start with where I think the net zero is going. I think that net zero is going to become a norm. Um, I do think that there's going to be more electrified solutions and our dependence on, on natural gas type solutions or fossil fuel burning type solutions um, will we'll eventually find an opportunity to become more cost effective and, and easily employed on projects. I think that we're, we're getting closer to that. Um, so there's that one with regards to net zero energy and electrification. So the challenge is embodied carbon and water. Water is where I think that a lot of value is gonna be placed on engineers to find a net zero or net positive water solution. So I see from an MEP standpoint, that becoming the next hot topic is embodied carbon and net zero or net positive water. From there, we start talking about new construction versus renovations and existing buildings. I think that new construction is going to continue to move towards automated design, whether that's from Autodesk or whatever plugins are out there. Um, and I do find that there is a place not only for MEP consultants to use automation, but also architects. And then you start talking about modularization and you start talking about turnkey solutions where contractors, engineers and architects work together to build modular style design types where owners can pick options within those modules. So you have very tight cost control. It can be built off site. Construction sequencing can speed up. Um, and then the automation process becomes a lot simpler. So I see new design becoming a lot simpler. And then the value, again, placed on MEP engineers who are familiar working with existing infrastructure, existing buildings, going in and doing your existing building audits, focusing on how you do large scale infrastructure replacements, whether that's generators for emergency power on a large scale hospital system, uh, where you're talking about life safety needing to be supported. Um, so I see that that being a very critical point for um, for where I think the, the future is going. So um, automated design and modularization, um, a focus on uh, water and embodied carbon. And then the last one, a focus on existing buildings for where design professionals can really create value for themselves moving forward once that autom autom automization becomes implemented on projects. So I'll, I agree with a lot of things you said. Like automation for sure, modularization for sure is, is coming. I think net zero is a big topic. Um, and body carbon, I believe is gonna be more prevalent just with engineered wood and stuff like that, which then you get into, the other side of that is your insurance and liability now, <laughs> having a full wood, wood structure. Um, and how to mitigate, you know, fire risk for, for those buildings. And then the only thing that I would slightly contend with is I think water in California and in the West is a very big deal. And then on the other side of it, <laughs> you look at like uh, the Mississippi Delta that floods every year and most of the East Coast water is not really a problem. There's plenty of it. The water table's fine. But California uh, just 
historically water laws and water distribution through California and most of the West is there's a lot of problems with it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm fully on the water thing. I think it's just, it's uh, regional, not necessarily at a national stage. I would, I, I would implore upon you um, with regards to the Mississippi Delta and Louisiana and that whole area, right? You start talking about how the Delta floods, right? And causes damage to all of the water treatment facilities and pollutes so much of our rivers because of that flooding. And if you did localize water control at the building level, instead of having to go back to an, you know, a utility level water treatment plant where that becomes a water pollution risk, it can help solve that problem too. So it's a national thing and it goes beyond just water conservation. It's also making sure we're not polluting our bodies of water that surround us. Yeah, that, that I can, and I'm, you know, thinking up in Iowa too. And, and for that piece in, what gets thrown back out. So like in, in New York City, for example, anything that, that goes down the drain, once the sewers are full and those and stormwater is full, it just empties into the Hudson. So yep. you literally have sewer water going into the Hudson. So I'm, I'm fully on board with it uh, it being a problem when you when you phrase in that way of how water gets treated and that, that process of water. I, it was more the conservation piece. There's certain... <laughs> <laughs> certain areas that I don't think, uh, you know, conservation is quite what it is in California. Yeah, when I, when I, I presented at Green Build last year with um, uh, a couple of people, uh, Monica Alfamitano from CSU Long Beach, uh, Stacey Olson from Gensler. Uh, we had Eric Howe. He was at NSU at the time, which was a wastewater servicing provider that does membrane bioreactors and the like. Um, and the, the way that the conversation went was also how much the earth has actually sank in on itself because we've been depleting our aquifers so much. So it's how much we're depleting our aquifers. It's how much pollution actually exists when the when the rivers and deltas flood and go into our wastewater treatment plants and that spillage comes over and does a lot more damage than good. Uh, and then also from an intrinsic standpoint here in California, the fact that we have what 10 million people that just live in LA city alone, LA is a desert and we all choose to live here. So um, there is that importance of the con conservation side too. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, being in the mountains of California and just the million miles of open air aqueduct and yep. evaporation yep. loss, like it's, uh, you know, it, I think learning about water, especially if you live in California is, a uh, is a hugely big deal that more people need to uh, spend some time learning about where their water comes from. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause most of it is, is from the mountains or, um, like for LA it comes uh, some of it from up here and then some of it from like the, the Hoover and, you know, Vegas, it gets pumped, you know, hundreds of miles. To right. the <laughs> and one of the last questions that I have um, now that we've, again, go, go research water. There's a lot of things that we, I think we can all do on that one, uh, <laughs> but is if there was, if you had a magic wand, if you could solve one of the problems within construction within our industry, what would what would be your? If you had one wish, what would uh, what would that be for for the construction industry? Yeah, it's uh, it's teamwork and communication. Um, it's that simple. Um, when we're talking about system selection, there's more to it than just dollars. Um, it's also understanding what the owner cares about. Um, do they care about their greenhouse gas emissions? Do they care about their water use? Do they care about their EUI? Do they care about their operational energy cost every year? Um, what is it that they actually care about? You know, is it acoustics? Is it, you know, indoor environmental quality? Um, that dialogue and ability to communicate with an owner to really extract what they care about so you can provide them with a solution that actually serves what they want is highly important. Likewise, between engineers and architects, having each other's backs, working as a team, working towards the same goal, communicating to make sure that each other don't fall into pitfalls, right? Don't put your electrical room right behind a stair and next to an elevator. It's just not going to be, you're not going to get the conduits out because um, you're going to have that big duct that flies by that you, also blocks the path. Um, simple things like that. And you have to remember that there's junior people on the architects team, there's junior people on the MEPs team, there's junior people on the construction team. So now we've talked about making sure that the junior architects and junior engineers don't fall into common pitfalls for, through communication and teamwork. Now let's take care of our contractors because without them, everything we put down on paper is not possible. 
skilled tradesmen, skilled laborers are so critical for our industry. And I think that it is so, so important that we as engineers, designers, and architects communicate more clearly, better to them to understand the intent of our design and work together to find cost-effective solutions that ultimately serve the owner. So, um, and then you have, you know, you start talking about owners that want to do large scale philanthropy type things with low budgets. And, you know, we can start supporting those types of things by that teamwork and communication. So that's what I would fix in the industry. I think you nailed it, Cameron. I and mean, we've talked about that topic a lot on this show since I came aboard, but you know, as an industry construction has a lot of really big tables. And if we would all just pull up a chair and, and have that open communication across the different division and across the different specialties, there, there's no telling how much that would help. It would be immense. Yeah. It's just absolutely immense. So thank you for coming on Cameron. It's been a fun conversation. Guys, today we learned about mechanical system selections, about reducing your footprint first, reuse, reinforce renewables, digital twins, momentum building, taking a little time to do that little bit extra, you know, really having the, the end in mind <laughs> and communicating across uh, all the trades, all the disciplines, and, you know, really helping people bridge bridge the gap from wherever they are to where they want to be, whether that's from school to the profession, from, you know, a entry level person to a, you know, VP within a, a decade. So whatever it is that you're looking to do, there's, there's somebody within this industry that is more than willing to help, um, you know, whether they're in your firm, in a, <laughs> through a podcast, through other outlets here on LinkedIn, there's plenty of them. Um, guys, if you have any questions, if you've got any building needs for, you know, net zero, uh, especially in educational facilities, Cam, uh, Cam is your guy. And, uh, with that, any, any last remarks, Cam? No, just thanks so much for having me. I uh, really, really appreciate, appreciate working with you guys. Thank you for coming on and sharing, uh, so much through, for, you know, how we can get better as an industry, how we can help, uh, the next generation and, uh, for everybody out there, until next time.